Hi guys and welcome back to Just Jimny. Um, in this episode we're going to have a chat about the differences between um, road tripping and overlanding. Um, we recently did a road trip down to Cape Town. It was about 3,200 kilometers. Out of that 3,200 kilometers we did about 500 kilometers of gravel road. Um, I'm also going to go through uh, the stuff I've got in my vehicle for these type of trips. Um, we need to remember the gravel roads in South Africa are not great and especially the gravel roads we did uh, through the Karua. Um, they are, uh, I'd say, everybody knows that you, you're going to get a flat tire on them. Um, it doesn't care what type of car you have. Um, uh, positive for me was that most of the locals around in those small towns, everybody's got a tire repair shop. And all the locals are driving B of good ridges. So that should tell you that extra side wall strength and that extra weight you get on the B of good ridge tire actually has a positive towards it as well. These gravel roads were tough. Um, we'll show you a few pictures, videos on that. But first off, let's discuss the difference between overlanding and road tripping. Um, road tripping is, you know, you. You can throw a tent in the car, or you can book chalets, tented camps, all that type of stuff. Overlanding I see as you're fully self-sufficient. Um, I don't see overlanding in South Africa happening um, as big as it is in uh, Australia. Most South Africans need to travel across the borders to get to places where it's actually safe enough to pitch your tent or your trailer, that type of stuff, underneath the tree. and You've got no ablution facilities, anything around you. Um, why I opted this, this road trip, um, or why I actually decided to do a road trip um, in South Africa is because, you know, if you're taking a tent along, pulling a trailer, or you have a rooftop tent, which I still don't recommend, is you're still going to book into a camping facility along the way. And at the camping facility, you're not doing true overlanding. Um, you're plugging into their power, you've got bathroom facilities, you've got running water, dedicated stand places. And are you actually overlanding when you're doing that? Um, if you guys know about places in South Africa that's still safe enough, where you can just pull over your car, pitch a tent and sleep over for the night and it's safe enough, please let me know about that because I haven't discovered a lot of them. Um, and you know they, they're not in places where you can actually utilize them if you're on your way somewhere um, normally they in way out places so you're already road tripping up to there in the in the Germany specifically um, we try to do um, 640 kilometers max per day um, those were long stretches, especially in the Germany. You don't have a lot of lumbar support on the seats, so you, you get a bit un uncomfortable. Um, the setup I had was perfect. Um, if you watch my previous videos, you'll see what setup the Germany currently has. And I must say, I won't add any extras to that car now, if, if I'm going to do road tripping. This car is set up perfectly for a nice long road trip now, doing 4x4 trails over the weekend. And, you know, like we said in previous videos, you don't need steel bumpers and all that st and a winch and 30 inch tires to go off-road with your Jimny. You can do most of the trails around in South Africa with almost a stock Jimny. Underbody protection is a must. Good tires are a must. And if you're planning to doing road tripping or overlanding, look at the suspension videos. They will tell you, you need that in your car. Um, especially on the bad gravel roads we had and even the bad uh, tar roads we have in South Africa. Um, things are going to happen. And I want to show you guys what I've got permanently in my car um, for these type of trips. Um, we do them alone. It's not part of a group. Road tripping you can actually do alone if you are prepared. And you've got off-road insurance, off-road recovery, that type of stuff. You can do it alone without major issues. Overlanding is another story. That's why guys have trailers and um, extra packing spaces and packing systems 
and that adds a lot of weight to your car and you're still going to a, a caravan park to do your camping. Um, positives, negatives on that, let's hear it in the comments. I'm going to give you my opinion on this. So, let's quickly have a look at what I've got inside my car. Okay, so the one thing I always have in the car are my camping chairs. We've got two of these uh, natural instinct platinum chairs. Um, I'm very happy with these. Uh, it's a heavy duty chair. It can carry up to 150 kilograms. I'm just 120. So <laughs> it's heavy duty enough. Um, it's got a cool storage bag with coolers and everything inside. You've got the cup holder. And you know, it's a heavy duty chair. So they are a bit heavier, but folded up both of these actually fit behind the seats they've got the uh, seat uh, or the covers that come with them as well and you know even with the seat set back all the way to the back um, both of these fit in behind the seats next up I've got my trusty TJM compressor quickly open it up for you guys yes it is a massive compressor but um, I got this with my previous Jimny it's still going fine it's not giving me any problems at all um, it's got normal crocodile clips that clip onto your battery and then inside it's got its stretchy pipe with its gauge on it so this gets the tires inflated from 0 0.8 to 1 1 bar that I normally run off-road in a gravel road and back up to 2 bar it takes me about 2 minutes per tire to get that done so this actually goes underneath the chairs behind the seats and it fits in as well I'll show you guys how it fits in um, this is a cover that I bought for the uh, compressor uh, from camp cover it's actually made for this TJM uh, dual head compressor and happy nice easy to carry around and that's why I still have it great after that my recovery kit also always in the car um, this is a recovery kit that I won at one of the competitions here I've got uh, my two sets of gloves for recoveries I've got decent shackles and at the bottom as you can see there that's my recovery strap this is a kinetic strap um, but it's it's uh, I think it's a very high rated uh, kinetic but it works well for normal recoveries on Jimny's on Jimny's and um, if we have to recover bigger cars as well so keep this with you you never know when you're going to need it also underneath my seat and it fits in there then for this little parcel compartment at the back a lot of people take it out because they think it's a waste of space but everything you see here fits in neat and tidy without any problems so I've got my ARB deflator this is also I had this since my previous Jimny happy with this I see there's a new one that actually doesn't remove the valve a lot of guys complain if you remove the valve they turn it in skew and then you get leaks and that type of stuff so have a look at these it works for me um, the cheaper ones work as well but deflation kit keep it in your car you never know when you're going to need to deflate your tires to take on a bit of gravel road or when you're 4 by 4 on the trails everybody deflates it's the good thing to do it's good for your tires and it makes the ride a lot more comfortable in your car weight wipes you need them anytime everywhere um, you know off-road on-road anytime your hands are dirty you just want to wipe something down 
we always have these handy at the back here and we've got another pack in the front as well on our front seats then my little utility box suntan we're in Africa if you're out in the sun put sunblock on you're gonna regret it if you don't headache tablets morning after remember that <laughs> Then I've also got a, a nice mag light uh, that's rechargeable. It's a USB one with a magnet on it. Um, nice to stick on your car when you're working on something. And like I said, it's got a tiltable head as well. So you can tilt it in different positions. Look at the shops online. Everybody's got nice stuff available. This one I got for free from Telcom. Thank you very much. <laughs> I used to work for them then my trusty Leatherman um, also a Bridgetown competition prize I think but a Leatherman is always handy you've got a saw on it you've got pliers on it you've got a side cutter on it it's always with me this is a, another nice little multi-tool that I got I think it's like a 31 in one type of situation you've got um, your different sizes for for bolts uh, you've got the saw you've got blades you've got measurement all that type of stuff so nice little tool to have never used it before but if I need it it's there packet of blitz these sealed packets are great they're small I always have one with me because if the if it's the one thing you ever forget when you go camping fire lighters then I've got a USB cable to charge the torch with and other devices bit of tissues and that's that's it for the utility bin that I have then I also have my headlights they either here in the back or in the front uh, in my seat pockets on my Takla seat covers um, everybody knows how useful these are if you go out camping even if you're driving at night you need to change your tire that type of stuff these headlamps save your life so always make sure you've got these and a spare uh, pair of batteries for them as well um, this is a nice one um, that also adds the in the center you have the UV light so that UV light uh, when you go camping in places with a lot of scorpions that type of stuff it's really good to have the UV light with you because it lights up the scorpions instantly so that's headlamps next to that I've got a tire repair kit um, this was one of the essentials I had to add before we did our road trip because I knew about those bad gravel roads and I didn't want to get stuck with a puncher there and sometimes the guys you've just got one spare um, as soon as that second tire goes what do you do having these available excellent um, what you guys need to watch out for is um, I checked at a lot of the 4x4 stores and everybody and they charge you a huge amount for this I got this one from um, Midas Outdoor and it's actually better kitted and suited than the ones Outdoor Warehouse or the, the 4x4 distributors have available um, or at the time I was looking for them um, this kit worked me out about 350 Rand and it's got your reamers the different plugs the tire cement that you use with the plugs and then I made an addition of uh, additional valve key and extra valves because these do fail um, every time you inflate your tires, you deflate your tires, you've got a chance that your valve fails. And of course, in addition to that, some extra valve caps. Um, I went for the metal ones with the rubber inserts at the bottom. Because if you run into valve problems, you don't have an extra valve available. These will actually do the job for you. Go for the metal ones. There are ones that look like metal but are actually plastic they normally use the, uh, lose the top of their caps and they're useless to you so that's why I went for the metal ones 
Currently I've got nice metal Suzuki ones on my uh, tires, but if I lose one of them, I've got replacements for them as well. So that's my tire repair kit. Um, the previous one I had had mushroom plugs in and all that stuff, but you know what guys, then you have to have levers to get the tire off the rim um, and all that type of stuff, so I think those are a bit irrelevant. You'll be able to fix a tire, even a damaged sidewall on a tire, with multiple of those plugs, and it's going to get you to a place where you can get that tire properly repaired or replaced. Okay. Then, first aid kit. Um, this is one that I got from uh, Outdoor Warehouse. Um, and it actually gives you a full contents at the back of what it's got in. It's got one rescue blanket, antiseptic wipes, uh, vinyl gloves, uh, paper tape, bandage tape, triangular bandage, first aid dressing, uh, sterile gauze, safety pins and plastic forceps. So for your normal day-to-day off-road um, and even, you know, normal day-to-day, -day, this is a great little kit. What I did add extra was these plasters. The roll plaster, if it wants to stay in my hand. <laughs> um, because even in water I know these stick really well. And then I added uh, a betadine. Uh, Sulf as well. Um, this is antibacterial, fungicidal, and virucidal, and it helps basically to um, for insect bites, all that stuff. So if you have something similar, something you trust more, throw it in there. It's always nice to have, and especially when you're changing tires, working on your car, you tend to nick your hands and fingers. That's why those plasters are there. Somebody, you know, falls down. You've got something to, to help them out, get that wound clean and dress it up. Okay, so with my front runner roof rack, I've got these tie down straps as well. So they're always at the back of the car in that, uh, that parcel package. And you know, these hook up anywhere you want them to hook up on the, the, the roof rack. And I normally use these when uh, on a road trip when we buy wood and that type of stuff, I don't have to put the wood at the back of a car. Just throw it up on the roof rack, tie them down, and we can have a bride that night. South African legal requirement. Every car needs to have its warning triangle. This is one of those fold-up ones. It's a need, If you don't have it with you, get one because it's actually law in South Africa that every car that needs to have this one. If they didn't give you one with Suzuki, go and see them. They should supply this, otherwise this car can't get a road with it. And then, last not least, um, again, uh, got this, this tool set uh, at uh, Midas Outdoor. Um, this is a basic tool set. This is going to help you out to, um, you know, if you have a rattly back door, you can actually adjust it at the back there toolbox is going to do it. Let's quickly open up and show you what it's got inside. So I've got from a 6 up to a 22 size spanner and I bought these two screwdrivers extra. Um, for the rest you know you still need pliers, cutting implements, all that stuff. That's why I've got the Leatherman. So it's small, it's lightweight, and it's still going to enable me to tighten, loosen, remove anything I need to do on the gym. So, have a look at that. This was also, um, I, I think, essential to have with you on a road trip. Uh, this little toolkit. And it's nice and compact. It doesn't take a lot of space. Um, you guys, even if you don't know how to work on your own car, um, Somebody next to the road might be able to help you and they can maybe use tools so even if you can't use them somebody else may be able to use them and help you out to fix your car and it's always nice to have a little tool set like this. And that's everything that goes into the back. 
So I'm quickly going to pack this in and then we're going to show you how everything fits in the places we just discussed. Thanks. Okay guys, so as you've just seen, everything fits 100% back in your parcel shelf. Quickly accessible, even if you have luggage, everything in here. You can still open this up, quick access to everything without unpacking anything. That's a, a nice thing to think about, you know, is it doesn't help you have a first aid kit, but you have to unpack everything before you can get to it. Think about these things, think about the spices you've got available and pack it to in a way that, that's going to work for you. Um, and this has worked very well for me so far. It's actually got a lot of space. Another thing I forgot to mention is um, normally we have a lot of plastic bags as well. Um, you know, when you quickly stop, you do a bit of shopping, you've got a plastic bag. I put these at the back here as well. There's a space for them. And um, what I use them for is any trash, anything you can collect, we put in those bags. And then we're, we, when we are either doing a stop at a petrol station or any place that's got a dustbin, we've, we've got those available. So those plastic bags are great. Um, that's, that's it for... Okay, so before we get to the front seats and everything we've got there, we need to talk about these as well. Um, before I had this rubber mat uh, from Suzuki, um, I've talked about it. These are available from all the most of the Suzuki dealerships in South Africa. Um, very nice. It prevents everything from moving around and scratching on your car. Then we've also got these mats. These were the first ones I got. Before I got the other other mat, rubber mat, got these from Adol Whereas, I decided to keep them in the car. Um, you know, when you've got a lot of stuff loaded at the back, it gives a bit of cushioning when you're driving a corrugated roads, that type of stuff. And they are very handy for when you want to work underneath your car or need to change a tire, throw them out on the floor. You don't have to be in the sand and mud or the grass. And they're always available, they're always in the car. Um, another use that I thought of for these rubber mats that I've got at the back, um, we've got two in the back and two in the front as well, we'll show you those, is, you know, if you guys are stranded, soft sand, mud, that type of stuff, these are rubber mats, throw them underneath your tires and they might just help you get out of a tight spot. So I, I think anything that's got a dual purpose needs to be in your car. If it doesn't take up too much space, why not have it there? Um, as you can see, those are both the chairs fitted behind my front seat. This car is set up like this permanently. Day to day, these are my 3D printed tow hooks that I've got as well. Um, and that's to tie down um, your ammo cases, your cooler boxes, fridges, all that stuff, they haven't failed so far. Um, they printed out of uh, carbon fiber filament and you know I use my normal tie down straps for them as well. So when you've got a lot of stuff that's uh, above seat level, you know under hard braking, bad road conditions, you don't want that stuff flopping around in your car. I know Suzuki has also got these available but they're very expensive. Um, I'll try and find the design for you guys and post it uh, on my videos as well if you want to 3D print them yourself. Um, I don't believe it's that difficult, but it's a simple design and it works well. And, you know, no metal clinging noises while you're driving around. It's a positive for me. Okay guys, let's have a look at the front here. With these Tuckler seat covers we got, uh, they actually call this a gun pouch that they add extra on your Tuckler seat cover for you. You've got these side pockets as well, they're really nice for um, IDs, passports, that type of stuff. And then you've got the big mat back at the back that I'm not currently using because my, seat, my, my uh, chairs are constantly there. Then in here, I don't have a lot but my wife does. <laughs> And another thing I have is I've got my uh, little Bosfark radio 
with its charger, everything included, I've got under the seat there. Another piece of nice kit to have uh, are these small little uh, jumper cables. This is, uh, I think, a 12,000 watt hour battery. Always charge, it's got its charging cable with it. If you need to charge up a phone, all that stuff, it can do it. But you can also crank over your car when your battery is flat. Um, this happens quite often at campsites, all that place. That's why I've got this one here. You know, it's, it's one night that you don't shut your door properly and your internal light stays on, and the next morning you can't start your car. Um, this takes up less space than jumper cables, all that stuff, and it's got multi-purposes. That's why I've got this one. Um, I think I also purchased this one from Midas, and it was about 800 bucks. So, doesn't break the bank, you've got bigger ones available. Have a look at them. And, nice and neat underneath the chair, um, this lip that you've got here prevents it from going into um, the space where your pedals and everything are. So, good. Okay, so now we're going to see what the recovery kit looks like behind this seat. Um, this is fully back. I need to put the seat fully back to actually fit into my car. Uh, but still enough space to have my recovery kit here as well. And nice easy access. Think about that as well. You're going to need this stuff when your car is fully loaded. Yeah, you just move the seat forward. You've got access to your bag. Now let's look at the other side. Hey guys, on the passenger side, um, in this front pocket, you can see it's quite full. My wife uses it really well. Hopefully we don't take out anything embarrassing. <laughs> We've got a bag here. In this bag, face masks. People, it's 2020. We're going into 2021, still on lockdown. And it's crappy to get to a, any shop you want to go in and you forgot your mask at home. So we've got enough spares. Even when somebody doesn't have a mask, they're available, we can give them a mask to be compliant. Otherwise, we're probably gonna to go to jail. Just Jimny stickers. As we see Jimny's on the road, everywhere we drive, if you find Jimny enthusiasts, we always have stickers with us. Come, ask us for a sticker, we're gonna give you one. Tissues. I don't know what this is. Coconut water, island blossom, hand cream. Oh! Another My Germany key holder that we actually got from Bobby. Thanks a lot for this one, Bobby. I think these need to go on my spare keys. But they're in this black hole. Lip balm. Because you can go nowhere without it. Oh, and you know what? Sometimes when your door squeaky, all that stuff, you can actually use this as grease. Dual use, you can go in the bag. And wait, there's more. Mints. You never know where you're going to need a mint. Have one. Okay, let's quickly move this forward. Now, I don't have a lot underneath... Uh, this side of the seat because I actually have an active sub in, in here. Um, it's a JBL active sub. It was an easier fit for me than putting in rear speakers and all that crap. So I just put in a JBL active sub. I'm very happy with it. It complements the two normal speakers in the front really well. And it wasn't that expensive. Um, I think I paid a thousand three hundred rand for this JBL sub and then another 500 for installation. You've got a separate volume control for it as well. So you can doof doof as hard as you want to. So here you can see the compressor. It's in its place, easy access again. And you can just move the seat back and it's back in its position. So, now you know. This is what the rubber mats look like. Like I said, I was thinking Soft sand, muddy conditions, these and the, the, the mat at the back might help you out in a tight spot. That's what I'm thinking about. But uh, 
that's the, the extras I have in my car permanently. Um, and everything's got a, a good reason to be in the car, or it has a dual or multifunction purpose. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about the road trip we did. Um, I'd like to call this, as you can probably take from the title, Loads, Roads Less Traveled. Um, we had to go down to Cape Town, we had to visit some family we haven't seen in a, in a long time. And um, we decided to, to take Roads Less Traveled. We've got the car to do it. Um, I, I think we're prepared to do this type of journey. And you know what, uh, a lot of South Africans, if they drive down to Cape Town, they jump on the N1, um, some of them drive 1,300 kilometers straight through and other guys take a break in the middle, sleep over at a hotel the next morning they carry on. We decided to uh, sleep over two nights um, in, in Kimberley and then another night in, uh, in Sutherland. Um, we wanted to visit small towns and places we haven't been to in South Africa. I think. Um, a lot of people are going across borders and exploring other countries uh, or neighboring countries in South Africa before they explore their own country. So, you know, I, I see you're already spending the, the money on sleeping over, the petrol, all that stuff. Um, and if you've got a car that can do it, why not? You, Like I said, you can do this alone um, if you're prepared. And, you know, have a bit of experience, know how to fix a tire, put a plug in the tire, all that stuff. Maybe we can do a video for you guys on that as well. If you're interested in learning that, um, add it to the comments. So our first leg of our trip was um, Pretoria to Kimberley. Um, we took a nice interesting route uh, via Paris um, and then a few other little small towns. You'll see that on the GPS map. And then we slept over in a nice little place called Stablewood Lodge. Um, this is about a kilometer out of the town, so it's nice and quiet and it feels like you're in the bush, but they've got these beautiful little uh, new tech uh, chalets that they put up and you've got a small little deck outside with a, with a bright place and as soon as you walk into that you've got full air conditioning and it looks like a hotel room, um, beautiful bathroom and it, it was probably one of the cheapest places we booked. Um, on our trip, uh, I think it was like a 650 rand. Um, we did all our bookings for the places via Lackerslot. Um, it's a nice, informative uh, website, and you know what? Even if you look at Booking.com, um, Safari now, those places, I think Lackerslot has got the biggest selection of these small little places around. Um, and another reason we we did it is we want to you know, support these small little businesses after COVID. Um, they had a tough time. Um, a lot of guys dropped their prices. Um, in places we actually got upgraded to bigger rooms because there was just nobody around. And, you know, I think using a platform like Lackerslop, you can support the right people. They've got good information. Um, they message you a day before you need to be at the place. They message you all the contact details of the owners and gives you basically a reminder on it and you can book anything everything online you can pay them online um, and it is just a great platform to use and that's how we discovered these places so Stablewood Lodge um, I would say just Germany approved um, when you're going to small little places hot places having air conditioner in a room is a big bonus you know you, you're spending a long day behind the seat uh, and you know, when you get to a place and there's a pool and an air conditioner, you can actually relax and get ready for the next morning's drive. Um, if you go to a camping place, um, it's probably cause, gonna cost you between two to 400 Rand for that stand. You don't have an air conditioner, you still need to put everything up, you still need to pack everything up, you still need to make food, all that stuff. Here you've got a fully full kitchen, bright place, everything set up for you the next morning. You can just throw your stuff at the back and you don't have to pack that heavy so you're going to be saving on fuel in any case and it's a big positive on the road to Kimberley um, we did about 150 kilometers of gravel that was between uh, farms it was a beautiful road um, enjoyed it a lot 
um, the conditions weren't that bad. I must say, um, some of the tar roads had stop and goes through the free states after Paris, those, those places, those roads were bad. Um, at one stage, I think we actually drove 30 kilometers next to the road behind uh, one of these big graders. <clears throat> and, you know, after that, on the tar road, got onto the gravel road again, and we enjoyed it. it was, uh, I think the, the, the town's name is Bosov that we crossed through. Um, that was the last town we, 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 we had before we got into Kimberley. And, you know, I think the only thing you guys need to watch out for is um, stop as soon as you go to the gravel road. Um, see how far that gravel road is. You know, if it's 10 or 20 kilometers, don't bother deflating your tires. But if as soon as it's more than that, I'd say stop deflate the tires depending on how heavily you load it um, if you heavily load it I'd go down to about one bar um, on the BFs and you know if you're not heavily loaded I normally go to 0 0.8 uh, on the car so you know those gravel roads are great to drive again uh, the BFs and the tough dog work great for these conditions so if you're road tripping that type of stuff, it's worth getting the BFs. It's got three ply sidewalls, you're going to have less problems with punctures, that type of stuff. And then with the suspension comparison we did, um, you know, the tough dog blew everything else out of the water. It's comfortable. And you can really say thank you um, when for that extra 10,000 that you spent on this, this suspension because it's that comfortable. Okay, so back to Kimberley after that short commercial break. Um, in Kimberley, you know, we, we started off nice and early in Pretoria, so we got to Kimberley at about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, even with driving the gravel roads. Um, one thing you need to look out on these gravel roads is you're driving between game farms and farms, so there's going to be farming implements, there's going to be uh, driving on the road, and there's going to be wildlife. We actually had a nice big kudu bull that uh, crossed the road right in front of about 20 meters in front of us and we didn't even see him coming. So it was one jump over the, the, the fence, one jump over the other fence on that road. And that's how quickly they do it. So keep a look out for that if you take these routes. Kimberley has developed a lot, I think. Um, they've got the big hole there. They've got a lot of history there. Um, we went to visit the big hole. I, I think the entrance fees that they charge just to go and look at Dallas is a bit much. It's 70 Rand and then you just walk out on the platform and you can see down the hole. Um, then they've got a full tour for about 140 Rand where they show you a short video and you can actually go down into the mines. Um, I'm from that area so I, I didn't feel it was necessary, necessary to do that. But you know they did a very uh, nice setup. Uh, and display of what they've got available there. I think it's worth a visit. You know, um, they've got small little gem shops around it, a nice cafe where you can order stuff. And then you can walk around in the old town as well. Um, we can see um, the oldest house in Kimberley, um, nice little chapel, uh, the undertakers. So you'll see in that picture, I wouldn't fit in those coffins they had there. Um, and you know, the old bar and a very nice interesting place called the Australian Arms and they actually do like um, sit down dinners there, a per appointment and they also have a uh, few rooms you can rent in the old town. So if you want to stay in Kimberley itself, you can actually book that place in, your, in this old town. I think the main reason we didn't stay there is because um, I think there's a lot of ghosts around there. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, then they've also got a lot of different museums around. Um, because it was COVID, they were a bit strict on uh, visiting museums, that type of stuff. So, but from previous visits there, I have visited before. Um, you've got the McGregor Museum, you've got the Salt Lake Museum. Everything put together quite well. Um, I think it's a it's a world class expo of how they actually put it together, and it's worth a visit. So, guys, if you're doing a road trip, Kimberley is a place to visit. Go and have a look what they've got available. Stay at Stable with Lodge, maybe stay in the, the old mining town, 
and see what's going on there. Maybe you catch a few ghosts on the, <laughs> on the camera. <laughs> and um, so the next morning um, we drove from Kimberley to Sutherland. Uh, this was a, a long stretch. Um, if memory serves correctly, it's about um, 647 kilometers with the roads we drove. Um, this was a very nice road to drive. Um, we actually went through uh, Bridgetown, Forsberg, uh, Williston and then Sutherland. Those, those were the, the peaks on this trip and we had a nice stop in Forsberg. That was just a nice body break because we basically drew, drove straight, straight uh, from Kimberley through all the other little small towns to, to get to Forsberg where we had a nice walk around. We went into the few shops they had there. You'll also see the Forsberg uh, Hotel. Forsberg is this little place in the Karoo where they used to have the, the Wegrai um, bull run. Um, they did that for a few years. Go and check out the videos on YouTube if you want. It's quite interesting. They've got a big pan there and they do different activities, all that type of stuff. Um, but one of the local guest house owners told us that Wegrai and them had split now and now they're trying to get their own thing up and running um, called uh, the Forsberg Pan Fun uh, event. So we're, we're going to search around everything because you know what, I think it's one of those special little small towns that still got all the old houses that everybody is, uh, you know, putting a, a, as it was, I would say. They, they don't um, modernize the houses, they, they keep the look of the old houses, all that type of stuff. They've got a beautiful church there and just a pleasant place, you know, uh, I think the the one shop we walked in it's like a general um i like to call it a cocky shop <laughs> so um where they have different jams and they've got all handmade stuff available and normally they have like a small breakfast place and there's one place we walked into the whole neighborhood was sitting there having breakfast together and having a great laugh awesome little place loved it so Forsberg, put that on your list. It's worth a drive. You can sleep over there. There's multiple guest houses. There's the hotel. I think you're going to have a nice time there. And from Forsberg over to Williston. But I'm not going to tell, talk too much about Williston on the going there trip. Um, from Williston, we took the most beautiful gravel road to Sutherland. This was a 140 kilometer drive. Um, road conditions. Uh, at the beginning were bad but I aired down the tires and it was a chew fly probably one of the most beautiful roads I've ever driven um, you know some places the road was so good that I could you know comfortably do about 90 kilometers per hour on a gravel road um, that's how nice the road conditions were and then we went through all the different passes on the way there because mountainous area, you're going to have passes. And in these passes, the different farms and the little farm houses that the people built there, the scenery was amazing. Clear, clear blue skies, amazing. Um, after that, we went into Sutherland. Sutherland, um, a nice, small, quaint little town. A lot of people may have visited it before. If you haven't, um, I think it's worth it. Um, Interesting fact, it's one of the darkest towns in the world and that's why they have the big telescope there um, that you can actually go and visit. Um, we couldn't get into the telescope itself, um, but at least we could put a sticker up on the board that was outside, uh, Just Germany. So if you're there, go and check out the Just Germany sticker on that board and then we could drive up and we, as close as we could get to the, the telescope. Um, it's a very nice relaxing drive up there, beautiful as well. And um, we spent the night at uh, Skitterland. Skitterland. Okay. We spent the night at Skitterland uh, Lodge in, in Sutherland. And, you know, nice old house, 
creaky floors so don't come in too late or start out too early you're gonna wake everybody up but we had the best breakfast there I have had on this whole trip um, they do nice Karua lamb chops uh, small little skull pikes so that's liver and coal fat for the ones that don't know that um, eggs toast yogurts all that stuff we had great service there we had a nice stay there um, beautiful ensuite room with an ensuite uh, bathroom, nice big bath in it. And that night we went out to uh, the White House. Um, we had nice dinner there, and drinks with a few of the guys that's putting up the, the wind farm close to, to Sutherland. Um, and then, you know, as soon as we wanted to leave, one of the guys actually came up and he paid the bill for the night. Um, Lucius, thank you very much for that one. We appreciate it. Um, and it shows how nice and hospitable these people are uh, in Sutherland. They also have 8 o'clock every night, they have like a small observatory in town where you can actually go and watch the stars. And then about 5 kilometers out of town you can actually go onto a farm. And this is a very knowledgeable person on that farm and he tells you everything. Unfortunately that night it was overcast so we couldn't watch any stars in Sutherland. Too bad for us, but we still had an awesome time. Next morning after that beautiful breakfast, uh, we actually had a track from Sutherland up to Rawsonville. Um, my wife's cousin stays in Rawsonville on a beautiful, uh, in a beautiful little farmhouse between the vineyards. Um, it's just an amazing place. Um, we'll show you guys a few pictures of that. And I must say, they are living in paradise. You know, you've got these beautiful vineyards uh, all around the house. Um, this house was actually one of the first houses that was built in Rawsonville. And it was a place where um, the guys doing the trek from Cape Town uh, into the great wide open uh, of South Africa, they had to stop to uh, water the horses, rest the horses, and um, actually fix the, the wagon wheels, everything. And that's what happened in the house they had. And later on in the, the Boer War, um, they turned the house into a mortuary. So um, we actually slept in the room that was the mortuary, <laughs> but we didn't see anything. A few cracks on the floor and everything at night, but I think it's just old houses. But we had an awesome stay and visit with them. After that, we uh, had to go to Cape Town and we decided, okay, um, we wanted to spend more time with uh, my wife's aunt. And a mother, to, a mother was visiting her aunt as well, and um, we wanted to get there as quickly as possible. And we thought, okay, let's take the um, normal route from Sutherland up to Mikey's Fontaine, and then take the N1 into Cape Town. Um, so we actually had a very nice encounter in Mikey's Fontaine. Um, yes, it's on the N1; it's busy. And, but it's a nice fuel stop, it's a nice break to stop and they've got um, the Lord Milner Hotel there and the whole of Mikey's Fontaine was actually kitted out for Lord Milner and his wife and all his friends so they've got this massive hotel there they've got Lord Milner's house and they've got service quarters and a big train stop I think a lot of people have been to Mikey's Fontaine but um, you know, we, we had to stop there, had a body break, put in some petrol, had a cool drink. And while we were doing that, you know, this random guy comes walking up to us and says, his name is Johnny, he's the tour guide for the Lord Milner House and Hotel, and he's going to show us around. I said, okay, fine, Johnny, go for it. Johnny gave us a very entertaining tour. You're going to see him doing impersonations of uh, Eugene Tablange and Nelson Mandela. Stam in die dorre woestijn van Vergersdorf. As meneer Mandela oorlog soep sal hy oorlog kry. Aha, weer beer. Is dat hy? Pernel was het Robin Eilert. I said to Jacob Zuma, If you like to play with the big dogs, don't ever piss like a puppy. Call me, I said, I'll get his book. Then we... He took us through to the bar area and he played some songs on the, the piano for us. Um, I must say he did that excellently and he, he does a really good Ray Charles. Have a listen to that one.
So, after Mikey's Fontaine, we went into Cape Town. Cape Town we visited with uh, my wife's aunt. Her mother came through, through from Saldana. We had a nice braai, everything. After that, we went through to Saldana. And we spent four days there. Um, guys, Saldana is a beautiful place. Um, they've got beautiful beaches. It's close to everything. You've got um, the Fredenburg Mall close by. Um, just across the bay is, is Longebaan. Everybody goes to Longebaan. Their beaches are crowded. Their restaurants are crowded. Just drive five kilometers to Saldana. You're going to have an awesome experience. We had a great lunch at Captain's Cabin with a nice view over the bay. We had a nice lunch at... Um, Sandstone. Uh, Sandstone, yeah. Thank you very much. There you're on the beach, basically. Just watch out if the wind's blowing. It's quite cold down there. <laughs> um, it was an awesome experience. We enjoyed this. Um, and then the one day we went out exploring. And um, we went to Jacob's Bay. Um, they've got a nice quaint little restaurant there uh, called the Veskas Black. I can recommend it. It's on the beach. Their food is amazing. Um, and Steve Hoffmer used to own the place. I don't know what he owns now, but he's not the owner anymore, but he used to own the place. Um, then we had a nice little drive around to, to all these little nondescript roads and we wanted to see uh, if we can actually get close to the beach. And um, we went to one of these lookout towers that they've got at, in Jacob's Bay. And while we were sitting there on the bench, um, having a cool drink and a smoke, um, some of the locals came up from Jacob's Bay. And you know what? They actually uh, from Cape Town, but during lockdown, they, they moved to their house in Jacob's Bay. And they spent lockdown there, which I think was an amazing idea. And we had a nice chat to them. And they told us, you know, take this gravel road, turn left there, turn right there, and we did it, and we came, you know, it was just an amazing drive. Um, it's basically small little two-track roads um, that follows the coast all the way, and amazing little lookout spots along the way, and you know, I think you can you can probably even do that with a, a car that's a bit higher off the ground. You can get to these places, but probably, you know, I don't think a lot of people know about these places. It's by chatting to the locals that we got onto this. And then we got to this place with this beautiful private beach. There was nobody there. Um, flocks of birds sitting on that beach. Amazing place. And then we took a sand road right next to the beach. And we came across beautiful dunes, um, thick sand, all that stuff, you know, we, we were still traveling alone, so I couldn't take too much risk of getting stuck because we didn't have good cell phone reception there and it, it would have been a, a nice, hot, long walk to, to, to get to a place where you have signal to, to call for help. So we didn't take too many risks, but I'll show you the guys, um, I'm definitely going to go back there with a few friends and we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, I probably think that's one spot you're going to be able to do wild camping. Um, I'm not going to disclose that spot. Um, you know, I, I think everybody should go there and try and discover it. That's that's part of the, the experience. You know, talk to the locals, find out what they know and go and explore. Um, but I'm going to take my friends to this place and we, we're going to have a good time there. I, I think dune driving galore, beautiful beach if you want to do fishing and there's a special little place that's going to be a nice camping spot I think. Out of the wind, close to the beach, close to the dunes, it's going to be perfect. Um, yeah, and then, you know, lockdown happened again during December. Um, you had to walk on the beaches with your masks on and um, you some places you weren't even allowed on the beaches so you know luckily we planned our trip in such a way that we would be home by the 23rd of December and our road back was a scenic route again um, from Saldana we went up to Lombard's Bay uh, before Lombard's Bay was Elon's Bay guys go and check this out it's basically a uh, 
it's an Aventura resort with a cafe and everything you need and that's about it. A few houses dotted around um, and apparently they plant a lot of potatoes there. That's the Sandfeld. So have potatoes when you're in Irlands by Lambert's by. They grow potatoes there people. Beautiful place to go. I think there's a lot of places to explore around Irlands by as well. Because remember all these small little fishing towns. The locals all have the um, hidden roads and everything they go to, their fishing spots or where they uh, catch crayfish, that type of stuff. And, you know, Lambert's by, Elon's by, you're close enough, visit the Maisbosskarm as well. Um, beautiful place, you're going to have probably the best lunch you're going to have in the, ever in the world you're going to have there. Um, at Lambert's we also stopped to have breakfast because we had an early start from Sultana. And there um, we went to Isabella's. It's right on the docks. Um, you've got a beautiful view out there. We had beautiful food there. Um, and we also saw a lot of other uh, guys doing overlanding, actually stopping there. A nice big Avico daily that was well kitted. Uh, loads of cruisers. And then one Land Rover that leaked oil there. Uh, but you can do boat trips to. Um, Bird Island from there, all that stuff. Lambert is an awesome place. Um, I can recommend Pity's Vlees Huis. Um, he's actually a, a great guy, friends with Gaisi Pinar and a Cheetahs rugby supporter. And we got good Boltong and Drovors from, from Pity. So go and visit him when you're there. From uh, Lambert, we actually uh, took the road to Clan William. Um, that was a beautiful piece of road. Um, guys, views you're not going to see in any other place. Um, that drive was beautiful as well. It was a tall road, but you know, a lot of bends and turns, everything. But the Jimny handled that without any problems. Um, nice, quiet road as well. With beautiful scenery. Um, Clan William, you know what? We didn't have a stop there. I just filled up with petrol so we uh, could move on. And, um, and it's the Roybos capital of the country. Wikipedia, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, beautiful town. After that, uh, we went to the Botterneck Pass. Now, this is a big pass just out of Klein William. You drive up that road and you keep on driving. And as soon as you're at the top, um, it actually turns into a gravel road. Uh, Amazing again, just driving through that scenery, took down the tires, went down the, the, the roads and then we actually had two guys passing us, uh, one in a, a Land Rover Discovery and he told us he, he already lost two tires on that road. We had another guy in Sutherland with his cruiser, cruiser that said he lost the tire on the Sutherland Williston Road. So guys, you know what? If the locals try be of, be of good ridges for those conditions, it must tell you something. And if each little town actually has a tire repair shop, it needs to tell you something. Be prepared, have the right gear before you take on this stuff. Um, then down Botterneck Pass, beautiful gravel road, it was about 130 kilometers again. And um, then we went into Williston. Williston, we probably had the best experience anybody could have. Um, again, small little town. We stayed at a place called the Ark with uh, Peter and Elmery. Beautiful people, um, both artists, and, and you can see it in, in the way they, they decorated this place. You know, they, they used to have the Williston Winterfest there. Um, that was for the town with artists coming in and they closed down the, uh, like the main road of the town um, to, to you know, have this, this festival but due to um, you know, governmental constraints and all that stuff they had to, to end that but you know, they're still running the lodge, they're still running the Williston Mall um, which is a little shop where they sell their arts and crafts and uh, their paintings all that type of stuff, nice t-shirts, um, I got my alien t-shirt for the, for the salt telescope, so 
go get one there. Um, and, you know, we had a great, great time there. Um, that night we actually took a walk up there and we had dinner at uh, well, Mana. Mana. That was the, the restaurant's name. They do real, real karua uh, lamb there. Uh, my wife had the lamb shanks, I had the lamb pie, but they do lamb neck as well. And you know what? If your grandmother comes from the Karua, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, karua lamb, something different, different experience. And then we came to this amazing experience. Um, the rain? Yes. I know. <laughs> it was for dramatic effect. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Edit me out, please. <laughs> okay. Um, that place didn't have rain in seven years. And that night we stayed over there. They had massive amounts of rain. Um, the next day when we drove out of there, the rain was still coming. And it was just amazing to see the kids dancing in the street in the rain. Um, you know, I, I come from the Kalahari area which also doesn't get a lot of rain but the joy you see in people's faces if they see this for the first time in seven years some of the kids and dogs ran away because they've never seen rain before because they're less than seven years old um, amazing experience to, to share this with these people everybody was out in the streets at night um, after the rain walking during the rain walking through the it was just amazing so um, the next morning we actually drove from Williston up to Christiana um, and we took the R63 uh, I think um, past Vosburg again because that was a nice quiet road, um, beautiful surface so we could make up some time because this was a 670 kilometer uh, stretch we did on, on, on that so it was a long drive and then from Vosburg we basically had rain up to Christiana where we were staying at Rigi Tuji. Um, I must say road conditions worsened a lot of times. Um, we actually um, had the wipers full speed where you couldn't see anything in front of you. So we had to slow down and you know a lot of guys still came past at full tilt. Um, with no regard thinking they're going to drive out of this rain but that rain kept on coming um, the whole day and the whole night. So, um, Bridgie Digi is the place where we stay just outside Christiana. It's on a beautiful farm um, that's close to the Vol River. So, you've got um, access to the Vol River on that side. Um, a beautiful round um, chalet that they built, massive rondavel shape basically. And you've got six rooms in there. You can sleep 24 people. They've got a full kitchen, um, a full little nice courtyard with a bright place and gas cookers, everything you can imagine. Um, and it was just the two of us that, that, that were there. We had all that space available and these, these people actually, you know, uh, contacted Lackerslop and said they're willing to take on two people um, instead of 24 in that time gap. It shows you how hot these people are are trying to keep their businesses alive and we had a nice stay there and the next morning um, from Christiana we had to trek back to Pretoria luckily this was a short one um, not too many issues or anything along the way um, you know the, the small towns there we're quite familiar with so we basically were finishing our road trip and did the last bit of tarmac for 570 kilometers and that was a quick one back. Um, this whole road trip doesn't need to cost you a lot of money. I think the most expensive place we stayed in was Kitterland um, and that was a 1,300 rand for the night. Um, all the other ones were below a 1,000 rand where we stayed. And then of course um, just to have my presence there, the family didn't charge me anything to stay with him. Um, and, you know, petrol usage, uh, I didn't, because we had to put in petrol quite often in the small little towns because you had long treks. So guys, if you're not familiar with the place, you're not familiar with the road, if you see a petrol station, rather fill up. 
you never know when the next petrol station will got to be there or you're counting on a petrol station and it doesn't have any fuel for you so keep that in mind um, I, the Germany gave me about uh, 12 kilometers per liter that was on the computer uh, trip computer and the only problem I had was that short little piece between Mikey's Fontaine and uh, Cape Town. National Road, truck in front of me, threw a rock up and now I've got a crack in my windscreen that's running. And I think there's a waiting there's currently a waiting period in South Africa for windscreens on Germany's. So um, I'll see if I can get that fixed. And that's the only problems we had. Um, like I said, you know, if you're doing the long treks in the Germany, the seat gets a bit uncomfortable um, after a while, but I'm also a big guy. Um, I fit comf comfortably in the Germany, but on the long treks, you know, your, your back gets a bit sore because you don't have that, that extra lumbar support at the bottom, the back of your, the, the small of your back. Um, but, you know, I think if you um, get a, a gadget or something that actually pushes that forward, you can do long trips in it without any problems. Like I say, uh, my ideal um, distance I want to cover in a day is nothing more than 500 kilometers. Um, especially if you're doing gravel in between. Um, it's a bit of an unknown because you never know what the condition of the gravel road is going to be. Um, on our way there, you know, the guys in Forsberg had rain as well. Also, seven years. And the gravel roads we took there, you know, the whole car was covered in mud because the roads just dam up and you don't know how deep those ruts are, so you, you go through them a bit slower. Um, and take that in consideration. Don't try and push all these kilometers just to get to the end of the destination. Um, I think your road trip starts as soon as you leave your home. Then you're out there, you're going to explore, you're going to see new places, you go to places where you that you haven't seen before and you know sometimes you get surprised by these small little towns um, you know tea capital of South Africa, Roibostia, Sandfeld potatoes um, you know stuff that, uh, that Google knows but you don't bother to Google about and I, I think go and have that experience there think about you know when you're doing a trip to visit somebody that's further take the, the road less traveled try it out um, I think it's a it's a good methodology. Um, you take roads that are not busy at all, so you don't get frustrated with guys driving badly or traffic being bad. On some of these roads, um, I think that the portion between Williston and, and Sutherland, um, we got two buckies and they were both farmers. They were farms there, nobody else. Um, and it's such a beautiful road. Go and explore it. You've got the car to do it. That's why you bought the Germany, I think. Um, you can do overlanding maybe once or twice a year if you're lucky. But you can do road tripping four or five times a year. You can do a road trip. And take a different route every time. And go and explore. You've got the car that can do that. And um, I want to thank you guys for your support during this year. Um, wish you a happy Christmas. Um, and you know we, we sent out on our Facebook page all that stuff so if you didn't get that we'll post it for you here now so everybody can see it so go and subscribe to those, those other channels as well there is other content we post cool pictures on Instagram um, our Facebook page is quite active we try and be active on other groups as well um, giving my, my opinion and advice to, to newcomers and guys currently we, we we're going to need more subscribers um, to keep this channel going um, everything i'm doing i'm doing out of my own pocket um, the extras on the car the petrol our time everything comes out of our own pockets and if we can get up to a thousand subscribers um, we can start monetizing with ads and we can actually get a bit of income for these videos so we'd really appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel and go and check out our other social media on Instagram and Facebook. And um, then 
we are sitting here on the 30th. It's not New Year's yet. Um, the President of South Africa has banned alcohol and social gatherings and everything for New Year. We are sitting alone, not in a group. That's why I'm not wearing my mask, so please don't find me and send me to jail. Um, but we want to wish you a Happy New Year. Have a great time. Go out. If you've got time available now, get in your journey, go out and explore, go and enjoy it, go and use it. It's made for what, what you want to do with it. And, you know, be prepared, educate yourself, and um, wish you all the best for 2021. Just jump me on.